I'd like to take a moment and thank our sponsor. If you have a laser device for training and you want to take it to the next level, or if you're looking to get into using a laser device for training, check out the products at laserapp.com. L-A-S-R-A-P-P dot com. You can use code CSP2021 for 15% off the items you've selected. And thanks for checking them out. Welcome to this week's edition of the Casual Shooters Podcast, your premier podcast for the casual shooter. This week you have me, Dave, and you have Leo. Yo. Yo, yo, yo. And as usually, as usual, we have a guest. This week's guest is none other than the Area 3 director, Matt Hopkins. How you doing, Matt? Good. How are you guys? Thanks for having me on. Doing great. Thanks for being on. Yeah. It is appreciated. (laughs) <laughs> so matt what we normally do is uh we start off with five personal questions to get to know you okay and then we move into the dirt sounds good <laughs> all right number one favorite movie so i've been thinking about this knowing i'd be coming on and as <laughs> of right now i have to say lone survivor oh okay Good choice. Why now? Why do you choose Lone Survivor? So I originally read the book for it, and then I saw the movie. And from everything I could tell, they did pretty good to stick with it. And every all those stories and articles outside of that, so it looked it feels really real. And it hit at a certain time. I read that it was pretty impactful to me, and like how people can not think about themselves and basically sacrifice their life for someone else. And that was really powerful for me. Well, now that you said it's very close to the book, I'll have to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's really good. You could have asked me that Dave. I would have told you (laughs) I can read. (laughs) But yeah, it is. And those, those stuntmen like legit through themselves, like through themselves off the side of cliffs to, Oh, Dave, you gotta, it's yeah. All right, I'll check it out. really good. Next movie up, then. All right, favorite book? Uh, I kind of struggle with this one. Let me think. You know, I think with winning in mind, I'll I'll say that one. So most people think of that uh, as it applies to shooting or anything like that. But if you take all the principles from that book and apply them to your life. It's actually very, very, very good for that. So I've learned more for my day to day and my work life from that book than just for shooting. Okay. Pretty cool. Hmm. All right. So our other guest host, uh, Huggy likes to ask people what their favorite superhero is or who they're. So, uh, it's easily cable. Okay. Yeah. All right. I don't know who cable is. <laughs> X Men universe. I, yep. I was like, you're gonna have to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, like a sort of like a cyborg. He has. He's a human, but he has, I think, mechanical features about him. He's always carries around a ton of guns and shoots and everything like that. So he has like really good aim and everything. Yeah, I well, believe the mythology the, is he's the uh, the son of Cyclops, er, not Cyclops, but uh, Jean Sorry. Grey and and the guy, the dude, not Logan, the other guy. He carries a really big gun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, was in, uh, he was he in was, the he Deadpool. was in the, the latest yeah. Deadpool. Yep. Yeah. Oh, all right. All right. Well, I have to go back and check that then. Favorite gun and caliber? Well, nine millimeter on caliber for sure. Okay. And remember who you're employed by. Be be very no, careful. I, I understand that. <laughs> that. That doesn't affect it. <laughs> so I'm going to say SP01 Shadow. Okay. Why and that, that was, one? That was a precursor to the Shadow 2. And it's the gun I have, the I've shot the most. And I liked it. And I actually got Grandmaster shooting that gun. So, And just recently, one of the local people started shooting that 
and shoot in an SPL one version. So I got to kind of go back and feel it and think, man, just remember how it felt that far back. And I still have several of them. So that's my favorite right now and still will be probably for a while. Okay. Now that that's what you got GM in, in production production. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. So while we're on it, then what are you shooting in carry optics? So I am shooting the P10F competition ready. It is a five inch P10 where we okay. added a flat trigger, extended mag release, extended slide stop. It has a, like a gold finish on the barrel. It's actually a titanium nitride finish on the barrel. So it actually held up with our lifetime testing way more than any of the standard black finishes on guns. It has an improved geometry on the feed ramp and chamber. And has a couple other gold features to kind of tie it in with the, the gold barrel on it. Okay. Is, let me see if this is what we're talking about here. So a little history behind that gun. Nope. That's the, that's the original P10. If you just search P10F competition ready. Yeah. Let me. Before you go right. searching on that. <laughs> 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 so a little history behind that. I started shooting the P10F because we started building them in the U S and I thought it was kind of right to support the company and do that and get the gun's name out there. And while I was shooting that, I learned what we should do to help optimize it for competition. And we actually increased the barrel length and slide length on it to a full five inches. And it's still optic ready. So we did the improvements that I learned while I was shooting it in competition and had it basically moved all that stuff over into a factory gun that we could sell. Okay. All right. I've got it now. Yep. That is it. Okay. We'll go up a little bit bigger. There we go. Okay. Yep. So it looks like most of them now, yeah, there's all the, a cover all that comes off. Fun. Yes. The competition ready all come optic ready already on it. We don't sell it in a standard slide. Okay. We assemble those That's, here in Kansas City in our facility that we work at here. Oh wow. Okay. I'm gonna well, that's cool. I'm gonna ask for the benefit of others. Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. So we are in yes. Kansas City, Kansas. Okay. The I real live in Kansas Missouri City. though. I live in Missouri though, so I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, we have employees <laughs> on both sides of the both sides of the state line, so it's okay. Yeah. It's good. It's good rivalry. <laughs> I've never been to either state, so I'm actually just saying oh, yeah, I, I have no clue. I've never been to either. <laughs> just depends on kind of where you grew up on people, where they say they want to be at. It's fair. All right. Both in America, so you're still winning. That's true, yes. Yep. There you go. Just ask Dave. So now <laughs> I saw the shirt. I saw yep. the shirt. <clears throat> Absolutely. <laughs> um so uh, i like to make the fifth one a little bit more uh unique to our guest mm -hmm. so i was like all right let me scroll through his instagram see what i can come up with and i came up with a very interesting picture okay i'm interested to see which one you picked oh yeah <laughs> so yes what's his name or her name i'm not sure it's it's a boy Okay. His name, his name is Shooter. Okay. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Uh, we have a girl also from the same litter. So we, and her name is six. So we have a six, we have six and shooter. six shooter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you, now how old were they when you got them? Uh, they were eight weeks old when we got them. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we've had them for, they'll be three years old in January. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're a little bit older than mine. You have Danes also? I have three of them. Oh, nice. Awesome. And Perfect. the top the top one yep. and the middle one are related. The top one is dad. The middle one is son. 
Oh, okay. Great. And then this one was from a different litter altogether. They're awesome. So they are this awesome. Is our, this is our second second set of Danes. And they've been okay. Great. Yeah, same with us. Our second. Now I've had Danes uh in a previous marriage, but mm -hmm. second set with um the current marriage. So yeah, I cool. did actually spoil them by letting them up when they were eight weeks old, like letting them climb and lay on me. Mm -hmm. And so you know how that goes. They continue to do it no matter the size they are. So, yes. And, and it doesn't it, matter if you're on a couch, in a yep. chair, in a bed, it yep. does not matter. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, they have no idea how big they are and they think they can just get up there and it's the same as it always was. So. But it's really yep. good. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah. It's, uh, two of them outweigh my wife. And the one always lays on her when she sits on the couch. So she yeah. cannot move. She <laughs> is stuck there as soon as he lays on her. Yeah, I think I have it another photo up there of when I'm in my chair. And oh, he's up oh. on that with me. Oh. Yeah, it might be a little before that. Oh, there he is. Looks like, a, oh, he's behind a gate. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't I have look regular sized dog, so yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm out on this one. And the first time I met <laughs> Dave's dogs, they S-whipped their tails into my hang down. Oh, yeah. And oh, I thought yeah. I was going to die because I had like a vasectomy <laughs> the week before. I was like, uh, uh. <laughs> the next time I went over to his house, I made sure to stand like right next to the couch so they couldn't hit me with it. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I guess I'm not, I don't have it up there. It's on Facebook. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're they're cool dogs. Sits, I sit in a recliner, and he sits on front legs on one arm, back legs on the other arm, <laughs> and that's how he lays down on on the chair because he's oh, too big to fit like on my lap. Just wow! Like, like so long and tall. How much does he weigh? Uh, I don't know exactly we don't take him to get weighed that much i know he's probably 130 to 150 or something like that depends on when okay. when the girls are in heat and how much he's eating so they actually fluctuate quite a bit yeah i'm um, same way when i'm in heat <laughs> <laughs> when your wife's in heat yeah pretty, pretty <laughs> that's how much i weighed in high school <laughs> like my freshman year yeah <laughs> All right, so Matt, um, I've listened to a. Uh, I, obviously, I listened to you on Practical Shooting After Dark, mm -hmm. um, but I've heard you on a few others. And one of the things I heard you say was you didn't, you didn't buy, you bought your first gun at twenty one. But had you shot before then, or was that the first time you had so, shot a gun too? I shot some pistols, rifles, hunting when I was in school with my dad and parent and mom. We used to go hunting. I used to go bowling pin shooting with my dad. Um, as soon as I kind of graduated or a couple years before that, we had tailored off and haven't done, didn't do any of the bowling pin shooting. So it was like five or six years since I shot when I bought that gun. Okay. What was that gun? It was a Smith & Wesson m and Oh, okay. 1 .0, yeah. So it was, it was a four inch striker fired gun. Now, how long after buying that gun did you find the USPSA? It was two or it was several months. So I bought the so let me a brief history. Someone broke in my house while I was away, and I'm like, I need to get a gun for protection. <laughs> so I bought a gun and bought a, a little hand open safe, did that. Then I'm like, I don't really know how to use this really well. So I'm gonna go get some training. And the training class I took, the instructors were competitors and police officers. And they invited me out to a match really close after the, after the class. And I went and shot the match. And basically at that point, I was like, where else can I shoot? And I went to Walmart and bought a bunch of ammo where you, when you could at that point. You could buy thousands yeah. of rounds at a time. Yeah, In the good old days. Then, Walmart still loved America. Yeah. $20, $20 for 100 rounds. Mm. That's right. They're not. They're not a sponsor, so it's fine. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. So I, then I started. Yeah, yeah. Then I started going. I was living in Tulsa at the time, so I shot the matches in Tulsa and around there. And I drove to Oklahoma City a couple months, 
and shot their match. So that was a couple hours away. I wasn't working on the weekend, so I had the time. I was working on cars at that point. So Monday through Friday, I could travel around. And then at the end of that year in 2007, I shot a the North Texas Open shooting production in C-Class and ended up winning C-Class at that match at my first state-level match. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, w- I was showing. pretty much I was I was pretty much hooked at that point and I looked for more USPSA centric training instructors and took training classes from them. So who all have you taken classes from? So I've taken classes from the TDSA in Tulsa. I've taken classes from Phil Strader. Um, I've taken classes from Ben Steger. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I pretty much, I've kind of hung out with Ben quite a bit and traveled around and we've shot as like just practicing. So learned took a lot from him. And I actually credit a lot of my learning for learning how to actually shoot USPSA and that what's best way to navigate through the stages with for a local competitor named JD Smith. And we had a local indoor match where we shot every Tuesday night and I attended that every week for years and we got to basically go in there we'd set up a stage and you could run it one way and we would leave it set up and you could try different things like three or four different ways of running a stage to figure out which way was best. And I credit a, a lot of my development to that, being able to test different things on the same stages. Because you guys know how uncommon that is. Yeah. Yeah, imagine that. That was huge in your growth. Yep. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot of experimentation. You can really say, oh, this looks like a good idea. And you're like, oh, that was horrible. Or you yeah. can say that this way looks completely horrible, but you end up doing it and it doesn't turn out that bad. So yeah, you get both exactly. ways of that. Yep. That actually just gave me a thought since there's three of us, we should mm-hmm. all shoot stages a different way and see which one's best because we know we're not going to win anyways. <laughs> well, the two of us aren't going to win. <laughs> Yeah, the two uh, the two up on top of the screen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I, that was meant for Huggy. Was, yeah. But, okay. Yeah. Now I got you. Yeah, yeah. Whew. <laughs> now, I'll how long did? Anyway. I'll shoot a stage anyway. Yeah. Yeah, you can do a lot of testing unless it's something completely incorrect, like. You start on the back right of the stage and it, you have to like run all the way to the front left and then you backtrack a bunch. The time is not that much different. There's some yeah, general I, principles you have to stick to that help you kind of figure that out. Okay, now now here here's a question. So how long did it take you to figure out those general principles? Hmm. So I I think I'm still trying to like kind of figuring them out or at least proving to myself that they're still correct. Okay. So I still revert back to some of them or question that, is this the right thing to do? And I think that's one of my biggest ways I can improve upon is just trusting that I know the way to do it is right and not second guess myself. Mm, okay. I get that. So do you ever come up with your plan and then see somebody shoot and go, Hmm, I wonder if I should do it that way instead. I've done that. I can do that. It depends on. I've actually done that quite a bit to try to get used to it and actually did it on purpose. So I can actually work on it or I've gone up to a stage and not allowed myself to walk through. And I've, got up there and just looked at the stage for two shooters where I wasn't on it or something or saw them shoot it and like didn't do a five minute walkthrough beforehand. So I've, I put myself in some of those situations where I could learn how to do that if, if I needed to. And, wow. and I've done it and I've done it successfully in the past and it would have to be a pretty big advantage and something you, that you didn't see at all to do it because it is, it is very challenging and you have to be very, very, very concentrated on running the stage in your mind and visualizing it. 
And that's the only way you can burn it in. Are Are you shooting uh, the world shoot if they ever have it? Yes. Yep. I'm on the so, production optics light team. If they do, okay. I, I don't know if they will. No oh, one yeah. knows right now. I, yeah, I'm hearing a lot of a lot of chatter that people are thinking it's not going to happen, but obviously it's still on for now. Yeah, but I, crying, the man. reason <laughs> the reason I ask is uh, I feel like you doing those things you were just talking about would actually help you at an Ipsic match where you can't see the stages ahead of time. You know, you yep. just have your walkthrough period and that's it. Yes. You you get used to that. So basically, you know how many targets. You can kind of start putting the picture together like this person's going to this area and shooting six rounds. And then like everybody does that. You know, there's three targets in there. If someone goes in and shoots seven rounds, you're like, okay, they probably made a shot up. But if everybody goes in there and shoots seven rounds, there's probably three targets in the steel. Mm. And you can kind of start seeing that stuff and putting it, putting the picture in your head. Cause you could pretty much see like they don't have walls blocking everything out, but you're just not on the stage in the exact shooting position where you are. So you actually have to rely on visualization quite a bit more. And then when you're doing your walkthrough, you just have to basically verify at that point. Okay. Or if there's a tricky spot you have to hit or foot position or an actual on-stage marker that you have to see if there's like a stake in a fault line and you have to hit that spot or something. Okay. Definitely, uh, Ipsix is definitely a different game. I mean, it just for from sure the, is, yeah. The, yeah, the different rules are, are – you have to stay within the fault lines. You can't yep. – like you can't be like USPSA and go around walls to the right. other side. <laughs> right. so, Socialism, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they spent all that time putting all those walls and, and fault lines down. They want you to use them. There you go. It's fair, I guess. <laughs> Don't make excuses for them. So you are you got elected back in, uh, what was it, August, I think, was elections? Yeah, it ended August 1st, and I was informed like on August mm. 2nd. Wow, that was quick. Yeah, they, they actually do a really good job from what I can tell. Everything's electronic, oh. so... Yeah, so they should know immediately. Yep, yes, exactly. So now what made you decide to run for Area 3? So... I wasn't super happy with the direction of the org was going, where they prioritized revenue over what is best for the competitors and the sport and the existing members. Okay. The admin the previous administration was prioritizing how much money's coming in versus how good the experience is for the existing people. Now obviously we can't have an organization with zero money coming in. But I believe if you make it really, really, really good for the existing people, they will continue to shoot for one and, and do it for more years. So that means more activity fees coming in, more membership dues paid. At that point, people will see that and then they'll want to also participate in it. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to do and make it better for the members. And that's, that's the number one thing that, I'm looking at for any decision that's made, any vote that's cast, anything that's being done on the board that I have a say in it, it's always going to be what, how, how is this good or bad or what's this do to the members? Because that's a whole organization. Without them, we wouldn't have an organization. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So is that um, why you voted no with the popper? So, uh, yeah. change so i think there's three i think there's three failures with poppers you can have a mechanical breakage you can have an environmental breakage or you can have someone reset it incorrectly i believe the shooting it twice only went to setting it incorrectly so it only addressed one of the three issues that can make a popper come out of calibration and the other thing was that it wasn't put to members first to get input on it. 
And I think we should take any rule changes that happen if it's equipment, a hundred like any rule changes, no matter what. It doesn't matter if it's reclarifying something about chronographing or something like that, or calibration or anything on the steel user equipment like the competitor's equipment or anything i think those should always be put out for member feedback before the board votes on them okay i I would agree with that i think there's i mean anybody can come up with something that no one had thought of you know like oh yeah we probably should address that yeah and i and the other thing is i think that at some level there should have been some input put into it from the existing RM cadre. So once they came up with an idea, send that out to the RMs and see how, what they think it would affect and change during a, an existing match that's being ran or just their thoughts on it. That makes sense. Uh, Has there been any discussion of using things like survey monkey where, you know, kind of like the elections where you can send a survey monkey survey out to the, either the entire membership or your CROs or your range masters or whomever. And you can instantly get those results back and then be able to disseminate that to the board and have a discussion and then come up. I have not heard of any discussions to use that. I think it, I think it has to be done. I think the first place we do it is serve after action surveys from matches that USPSA runs. How, how do we know besides just people offering their input on social media posts or podcasts or something like that, how we did, we have no idea. Yeah. And, and if we think we have an idea, we're only hearing from, the people that are being very outspoken about it. And if someone's saying like, if someone had a good time and they're like, well, if you did this one thing, it would improve the match greatly. But if a vast majority of the people saw that we should take that input in and use that to make the matches better. Yeah. I know uh, Keanu did that with area eight both years. Mm -hmm. So I liked that. That was nice. I was able to, you know, provide my feedback, whatever I had. Um, so that I, I like that a lot. I don't know if survey monkeys, I think they're pretty limited on the number of questions you can use. I don't know if that would be the perfect service or not, but once, once the board or whoever wanted to do it, they could do some little research into that and see if that's the best option or if there's other options. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I know we use, uh, where Leo and I work, we use Google forms a lot. You know, that's another free option. You can just send a link and then people can fill it out that way. So there's many different things. So yeah, unfortunately neither is a sponsor. (laughs) Right. Yeah. It's a downer. Now I also, I know that you are, potentially looking to run for president. Yep. And I say potentially, cause I understand you haven't um, asked for the, uh, you haven't petitioned them yet. Correct. Yeah. I haven't asked to get the petition to fill out. So you have to have, you have to request a p- petition from HQ. You have to get 50 signatures from active USPSA members to be put on the ballot. And I have not officially got asked for that petition. I did circulate previous forms that were for area director. And as of my understanding right now, those are no longer valid. So anybody that signed that is has not signed for me to run for president. Okay. So as soon as so, they get the, announce the election and put the dates out, I have everything lined up to get those 50 signatures within a week and send it back to HQ and get put on the ballot within minute, like within days. So I'm not worried about that. Okay. Now I assume the, the same reasons you became the area director, you're looking to become president. Yes. Yep. Exactly. 
Okay. And, now, and I'll be able to have, I don't know if I'll be able to have a bigger influence because it, it, you're once again, one of nine people that vote on anything. And you have to get people to think about what you want to do and agree with it. So you have to build consensus on that on the board to actually get rules changed or anything like that. And they're still kind of going through what the roles, responsibilities, duties of the new president will be. So no one even okay. really knows what that is right now. Now, when you were talking to Bill Duda, you said that you would like to see postings of the roles, job descriptions for president, board members, all of that. Well, I think all the board members, I think we're all in agreement and I've heard a pretty good agreement. And my opinion is that everybody thinks that the, the role, the duties, responsibilities, everything should be put out before the next election happens. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, and again, probably should be posted before. I almost feel like there, it should be posted somewhere so they can get feedback on all of that as well before yes. they so, make a decision. That is that is going to happen. The current plan is all the bylaw changes, any any changes that we come to a consensus on and make a motion on, we will we have to per the bylaws post that for a minimum of 10 days. So we may somebody makes a motion and someone seconds it to change the bylaws. At that point, it then cannot be voted on until the next meeting. And per the bylaws, that's 10 days. Uh, we've all agreed to put it up for hopefully as much as 30 days before it's actually voted on. And that's for, for, for a period of for comment too, right? That's for, that's uh, yeah. Any member yeah. can offer their feedback to any of the board members, president, anything like that at that point. And I would actually suggest it that people go look at it when it comes out and then send the feedback to their area director, section coordinators. And you can also copy all the board members on it. If you're worried about your area director, not, not taking the input and you think it might be better to send out to the whole group. You can also do that. Nothing so stops you, you from doing any of that. You knew what my next question was then. <laughs> no, I didn't. Go, but <laughs> well, as you were talking, I was like, "Oh, but what would prevent a one area director?" And that's where I was leading with it. Okay, yeah. The um, the what I was getting to earlier was the roles, responsibilities, all that. I mean, at this time, we're not even sure that the president will still have a vote on anything. Correct. Um, because the roles and responsibilities haven't been determined yet. That's true, I guess. But I've heard no talk of eliminating the ninth tiebreaking vote that the president would have. Okay. I've heard no talk of that. Okay. But somebody right, could like there could be something that comes out or and talks about that afterward. I don't know, but I've heard no talk about that. I don't. I don't actually foresee that happening. The. The general consensus, I think, uh, is that people want the the members to elect a national representative as the president, and that's what I where I think that's going. So I don't think that'll change. Okay, so it'll be just like in the past. I mean, he'll be one vote out of nine, so there won't be any more or any less "quote unquote" power to change anything on his own, anyway. No, 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 not at all. Okay. Because that there that seems to be a lot of the the discussion with the past president was oh he made all these changes but in reality he's only one voice out of nine so yeah well the board technically and the not technically the board voted in I believe early 2016 to change the the bylaws away from an executive director and a, a hired executive director and an elected president to an elected president slash CEO. So the president's role absorbed all the executive director duties, 
But there was also stuff in there that said at the authority of the board or with approval from the board. So there was, there was, the board has always had the power. Now, if the personality that was in there was very strong and didn't allow or didn't agree with or didn't ask the board if they could do stuff, that's what happens. But the board has always had the power. They always will have the power. And with each area broken up like that and geographically separated, it'll all come down to the board will always have the power. They can do all the changes. Not one person by themselves can do anything. Uh, well, and that's how it should always be. Mm-hmm. You, you had mentioned something on there too. Um when they were talking about rules changes about principles of divisions. Yes. Well, what were you referencing there? So what I'm referencing is we all know what revolver is. It's a gun Mm -hmm. that the cartridge revolver revolves. Yeah, exactly. We all know what single stack is. Single stack column magazine, single action triggers, 1911 style. Yep. We all know what limited is. It's 40 caliber major power factor guns, iron sights with magwells. Single action. Okay. We know what limited is basically open to do whatever you want. PCC, it's a rifle in nine millimeter. Okay. This is where we get into interesting conversations. What is production? Because the biggest question is, is it, out of the box nine millimeter guns that look sort of factorish or is it like that's what i mean by principles like what is, are this stuff carry optics seems pretty pretty set everybody can agree on that except a lot of people are trying to get single action guns into it and at this point i do not agree with allowing single action guns into carry optics it would drastically change the landscape of that division just based on magazine capacity and we don't even have to talk about triggers at that point all 2011s can get 23 24 reloadable in their nine millimeter mags and there are very few guns out there that can get 24 rounds in the gun at this moment that and we're not even talking about magwells or triggers or anything like that at the like but we can't even have that conversation until you get past the magazine capacity, how it would make obsolete the most of the existing guns out there being used now. Okay. I think that's all the divisions, right? Limited 10, we know what that is. Yeah. Yeah, you pretty much covered all of yeah. them. So, okay. Yeah, so I think we should figure out what the divisions are before we go trying to fix them or update them or change them or anything like that. And if everybody agrees that production is nine millimeter minor factory ish looking guns. And I didn't say anything about capacity there. It could be, is it a low capacity division or just a nine millimeter factory looking gun? Like that needs to be decided before we do anything with the division. Okay. Yeah. And I would Again, I would concur. Now, do you, how do you feel we are? I mean, we are a, the American or U.S. version region of Ipsic. Yeah. Do you, how do you feel we are with our rules in relation to their rules? Do we keep drifting further apart? I don't think we should change USPSA for less than 100 people in USPSA. And the people okay. that are shooting IPSC, that are that normally shoot USPSA, they all have the equipment to go over and shoot IPSC matches with their with either modifying their current equipment or have duplicate equipment, just IPSC equipment, like IPSC specific equipment. Like most of the standard shooters, which is the Ipsic version of Limited, have different magwells, different magazines, different base pads, 
and have the equipment for that. And we don't have enough IPSC matches to in the U.S. to justify any changes to the rules. Well, and, and that was going to be my next question was, do you feel we should have more IPSC matches just for those 100 shooters who do go and compete? I, I don't think we need to have specific IPSC matches for them. If they want to shoot their equipment, all of that those guns for IPSC divisions will fit into USPSA divisions also. So you could go and shoot your IPSC production optics gun in open or carry optics as you stand now. You will not be on the same magazine capacity level as USPSA carry optics, but that's by design from IPSC. They have 15 round limit. We have a magazine lean restriction. But you could go right. out there if you wanted to test your skills based on the IPSC rules. Nothing is preventing you from doing that in the current state of the rules or matches. Yeah, and I and I didn't phrase it right. I just meant, do you think we should have in the different areas maybe a, a few IPSC matches a year just in general for everybody? Not necessarily just I, – I meant that it would make it – it would give those 100 a little bit more practice – but it would also give your normal USPSA members a taste of what an IPSC match is. I think if people want to have those matches, I think it's more than I think it's more than fair to let them and nothing in the rule. You can have an IPSC match right now. Like I could I could host an IPSC match at Mill Creek at a certain date. I believe I have to ask the there's something you have to make sure and do before you do that and to call it an IPSC match. I, I'm not sure exactly what the reporting is on that, but you have to you have to do something. You can't just say you're having an IPSC match. Gotcha. And nothing's to say that you can't just put a USPSA match up that uses all the the IPSC targets and the 3 2 1 format or anything like that. And then put in the written stage brief that you have to stay inside the fault lines. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you could do that. You'd have to set up something to keep them inside of it. <laughs> Just because, no. you know, you know, USPSA competitors. Yeah. The game yeah. ship. They'll do anything to game a stage, even if it yeah. doesn't make sense or isn't yeah. faster. I'm going to run around this wall and add 10 steps to my stage <laughs> and have a super hard setup and shoot the hardest shot of the match because I ran around that wall. It's faster. Yes. I gamed it. And it looks good I on the YouTube it. video. Yeah, I gamed it, so it makes yeah. sense. That's right. So before we get deeper into the whole <laughs> president and all that other stuff, um, I want to jump back for a minute. What I know you primarily are shooting carry optics now. Correct. So what are your thoughts on, and I've been tracking statistics, and it is far and away the most popular division. Yep. So what are your thoughts on a standalone carry optics nationals? <laughs> I'm sure you've heard a previous podcast. So I think having standalone nationals is okay. As long as the range is adequate for a national level event that has a, that needs a minimum number of bays to host that, to have an adequate nationals at it. Now, I believe Talladega is an awesome facility. If they had five more bays, if they had 20 bays instead of 15, there's no reason to have another Nationals at any other location. But since Talladega only has 15 bays, I think it severely limits the level of the stages. And you have to double up stages to get even to a semi-appropriate number of stages like 18 to have a nationals event where you can actually test enough skills to get the best shooter at that event yeah i i, I would agree and then you lose a bay if you have sponsors and other stuff because yeah. i was even looking at could you where we all parked just above that you have that other nice pistol range area and I was like, oh, that'd be a great area where you could put sponsors because there's a building there. There's all, But then I was like, if you're a sponsor, why would you want to be that far away from the competition, though? You know, yeah. who's going to actually go out of their way to go up there? So that doesn't work either. So I agree. Yeah, it was very like, nice. 
the range is amazing. They have great facility. It just it it's only lacking five bays. That's it. And if they had five extra bays on there, hands down, it'd be the best range out there. It'd be one of them. I haven't been to Cameo yet. We'll see this year coming up. Yeah, that'll definitely uh, be interesting. One of the range master for the Virginia State match, Jim Mac Mac Burnett. Nope. Mac Burnett. There we go. I always say his name wrong. Mac <laughs> Burnett. Um, he actually did a bunch of IT. His company did a bunch of IT work out there. So in 2020, during that match, I was helping with that match. And he pulled it out and was telling me all the stuff that they had done, everything you can do technology wise with that range. It is amazing. I mean, you can stream from every single bay, uh, hardwire in, you could have scoreboards up all kinds of stuff. It's crazy how, and then I guess they just made a bunch more bays out there. So, yeah, I mean, they, it almost they, seems they like have, they have a ton of, they have a ton of equipment and a ton of space, so I'm looking forward to that. And I guess bring my the, winter coat just in case. Yeah, yeah. Holy <laughs> cow, that could uh, be very interesting. Elevation and cold. Yes. Yeah. When they announced was, it, <laughs> when they announced it, I immediately pulled it up on the weather app, and it's like, oh, 33 degrees. I'm like, awesome. This could be interesting next year. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely going to be interesting. I, I love the idea of having a standalone carry optics match. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I kind of felt like e even with at um, Talladega, I feel like they will fill every single slot that they have yes. without a problem. 100%. So I love, yeah, I love the idea. Maybe if you had it at back at frost proof or somewhere else, um, that'd be fantastic, but I, I personally am excited. There's a standalone carry optics nationals just for that reason. I, I think it'll be good. I think, I think it also makes sense to have a couple bigger matches like the back-to-back -back match for race gun and optics nationals we had this year. And I think mm -hmm. that probably makes more sense financially for the organization than to have a bunch of individual matches spread out all over the country. Uh, and that's just due to strictly travel every and RO like paying to get the ROs there. You, they have a set fee, like $375 to, for travel for ROs. And if you do that six different times, it's obviously going to cost more than if you do it twice. Right. And that and that immediate like that 100% goes to the bottom line of the org, and the championship fees offset that to some level. Now, what are your thoughts about one thing I've always thought is if they could find a central location in the middle of the country to hold nationals each year, I feel like that would also draw more people because you don't have, you know, you're going to uh, obviously Wanzik and Christian Seiler are going to fly from Washington to Florida every year. Gonna but, fly or, exactly. But there's going to be a lot of people that aren't going to make that trip just because it's so far. But if you have it in Kansas city, Kansas every year, now you have made it so that, you know, everybody's basically equidistant from the place. Yeah, and there's some level to that because if after you get out a certain number of hours of drive, people are going to immediately say that it's too far. So anywhere from whatever your number is, if, you, if you're okay to drive eight hours to a match and the match is 12 hours away, you might think of it because it's nationals to do it. But if it's 16 hours away, you probably won't even think about it. Some people will, some won't. And you'll still you'll get people to complain no matter where you have it, when you have it, what setup you do. So I don't know. I, I think you I think more information out there the better. And further ahead of time actually reduces that amount of complaining or people not happy. So that if, if they announce the twenty twenty three nationals this next spring. 
I'm not saying they will or won't. I have literally zero info on it. That would actually, I think people would be much, I would hope they would be happier. That way they can plan further in advance. They can let their work know that they want the time off. They can actually think about it for a while before they have to make a decision if it's worth it or not. That makes sense. All right. So now getting back to the the whole presidential thing, uh, I might be being a little nitpicky, but I, and I know that they're looking at a president and a CEO, but I've always thought of the CEO as the president. He's the chief executive officer, and I feel like this position they're looking to create again that they had in the past mm -hmm. is more of a COO. Yeah, I think the naming of the new position has, it's definitely, there's been a lot of conversations on that. And I think the current, they've settled on a name and it's not COO or CEO. I, and I don't even know oh, if they okay. put in the latest minutes. I don't want to say something I shouldn't. So give me one second. Yeah. But it's not going to be a COO or a CEO. It's going to have a different title. Okay. And. Let's see if an actual name was put in there. I don't know if it was or not. Yep. So current title they're working with is managing director. And that's in the November 16th minutes. Okay. I did so look at those, but I didn't catch and that. I, I think the biggest, from what I've heard, is that if you have an elected person that is also the CEO, they would be considered an employee. And that brings it its own challenges to if they after have, have to do anything like remove them from office an employee gets different protections than just an elected board member or an elected officer of the corporation so why not make them a contractor then uh i don't know that's a good question yeah i mean I will ask my wife, who is an HR professional, and find out. But because they're still <laughs> technically a, a satellite employee, I think they have like a few more protections than somebody who could just be like, the board finds you, like, vote of no confidence, scooch. Yeah, but I know, I know like, uh, Matt, we live in the Northern Virginia region. So mm -hmm. I know a lot of people. I met a lot of people who are contractors for the federal government. And literally, like right now, they're talking about the budget. They literally get axed and then picked up again a month later. Um, their contracts can be end at, ended at any time. So I know there are different rules and, and laws and stuff, but I've also seen that it's much easier because they're a contractor and not an actual employee that it's a little bit easier to sever those ties as well. Just yeah, a thought. I, I'm not, I'm going to admit my ignorance on this one. I don't know a lot about that. <laughs> um, they have a lawyer, like legal counsel, that they talk to on some of this stuff, um, and I'm sure they'll get advised on that. I have actually. There's been talks about conflict of interest because I've said I'm interested in running for the position, so I try to stay out of a lot of those conversations, or I talk very generically about it, just because there's obviously a potential of conflict there. And we've kind of set that the board has set some guidelines that obviously no one interested in the position would have any conversations or be in the room during compensation talks. And if anybody one feels uncomfortable. dollars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that only lasts one year with the current money we have, so. Right. Well, I guess that's you and Bruce, correct? That's me and Bruce, yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, now, and if anybody's ever uncomfortable or either me or Bruce are making them uncomfortable, anybody can say that and we would be excused at that time. Okay. There but each time talks. but at each time both of you would be excused, I take it. Uh I would assume so, yeah. But we okay. haven't ever done that. Okay. It hasn't gotten there yet. No. <laughs> okay. I don't think it will, but you never know. I so, try not to make them uncomfortable. 
I believe it. I mean, everything I've seen of you, like I said, I've, I've listened to you on a bunch of different podcasts. I've, I've not picked up on anything that would seem like you're that type of person that would intentionally make people uncomfortable. You know what I mean? You yeah, might, but you might you state guy, your opinion. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't think you're shy about your opinion, but I don't think you're that type of guy who just intentionally makes people uncomfortable. So I get that. Um, now, two of the people that I'm interested in seeing as president, uh, you might be able to include yourself in that conversation or in that realm. Rarified might not, <laughs> might, might not actually be eligible. Uh, how so? Well, I know that they're looking to make a minimum time in the USPSA, which yep. you obviously meet that. That's not yep. an issue. Yeah. But I've seen where they also want to add that you have to be a current RO. And I thought I saw something somewhere that said your RO has expired. Yes, it has. Uh, yeah, that's that's got a lot of conversation. Uh, that I let it expire. I don't remember why back in 2013 I did that. I think my opinion is just because you take a class, like I don't know what your guys' jobs are, but let's say someone's uh, a paper folder for the General Mills paper folding company and they took an online class to how to fold paper that doesn't automatically make them a good paper folder. And it doesn't True. mean that the person they hired off the street that was cleaning the bathrooms also couldn't learn how to fold that paper better than the person that took the class. You're not wrong. So. No one here is disagreeing with that. Nope. And <laughs> We've seen it. Just, yeah, we all have. Yeah. Class and degrees or certifications don't mean you know what you're doing. Well, yeah, that was actually the thing that was popping into my head. I'm like, master's degrees don't make you the master of anything. Right. C's get degrees, baby. <laughs> you know? Don't worry. Dude who graduates I'm medical school with a D average is still a doctor. <laughs> He's just and, not, hopefully he's a podiatrist because I'm not the guy. I don't want to go see him as my cardiologist. <laughs> and since that's the biggest topic of people's concerns with me running for president, that is going to be solved before the election even happens or is even started. So okay. if that's the only thing they got to, they have to talk about. They need to think of something else here soon. Well, I, and look, I, it may have been social media where I saw it. Where I don't remember where, but I mean, you know how that's been going nuts. Oh, I think it was me out at the members meeting that I was the only one that doesn't have it. So current okay, USPSA that, staff is, is calling it out also. So, okay. Which that's is, where I actually thought I, I saw I think that's super professional of a employee of the organization to call out a member. I think it's really good. A board member. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know a lot but I do recognize sarcasm <laughs> well, and I appreciate it in all its forms. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and I, I, I was, I was willing to state that, you know, if this president wasn't going to have a vote, you know, if he was just going to be the face of the organization and kind of drive it and lead it, but, and bring his recommendations to the board, but not have a vote. I was going to tell you that I don't want to see you leave the area three <laughs> director then because well, now we lost the vote. If you know what yeah. I mean? So, um, I was going to say, Oh, so here, another thing about the president thing. I have a question about, so we had Phil Strader on. I don't know if you listened to that one. Yep. I did. Okay. And one of the things, cause we had Ted and when Ted was on, I brought up the conversation with, Phil. And the conversation was, you know, he worked at Remington at the time mm -hmm. and Remington's like, you're spending too much time at USPSA. USPSA is like, you're spending too much time with Remington. We never see you. So I, even though there was the issue with the past president, I still, I still feel like that's the better option. And again, that person's only one ninth of a a voice, I still feel like a full-time president 
is kind of what the organization needs. I could be completely wrong, but I feel like it's kind of really hard if if you're the face of the organization as a president to have a presence if you're a part-time person. I think it'd definitely be difficult. I think this is something my opinion is that you need to set the duties, responsibility, the role of that person before you, you do anything else. So if the board thinks that that position is with all that stuff figured out, just a part-time position, then it makes sense. If it is more than that and the board decides, I've actually stepped out of this conversation. I understand. Them. But when I was setting the roles of the people under me, the buyers, the first thing we did is figure out what they're going to do, who they're going to report to, how long they're going to work. So then we could set up the, the wages, the salary, the benefits for that. Based on your, your requirements. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> so I've done that. I've changed roles here a couple of times at CZ and we always first figured out what the person's going to do before we figured out what the pay or the time requirements would be. So what do you do at CZ? I am the purchasing manager. I manage two buyers. I do some purchasing for CZ, mm -hmm. buying some, some more specialized items or stuff that is kind of like fire. Like we have, we need it now or something like ammo has been the biggest issue this year. And I do all the new product development procurement. So I go find new vendors, find, use the existing vendor pool we have to create new items for any number of things from gun parts to soft goods like bags or hats or shirts or anything like that. So the whole gamut from firearm components or ammo and I source all that stuff. I can do pretty much anything at this point sourcing wise. Wow. So if, if I was like, Hey, if something happens to fall off the back of the truck <laughs> and end up at my house, like you're the guy <laughs> that I would talk to. No, I actually, I don't, I said, don't, I'm, don't I'm lie to me, Matt. I manage the relationship. <laughs> Someone else receives the product in. We're, and we're managing it. our relationship right now. <laughs> exactly. You know, oh no, this fell. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. It's scratched. Here you go. And then Can't I report, and then I report all the uh, the updates to the team here at CZ. So okay, someone, well that seems pretty official. So disregard my previous comment. <laughs> <laughs> my, my bad. It, Obviously a joke, people. <laughs> Now, you guys sound like you're pretty independent of CZ in Europe. We're ran pretty fairly independent. There's still shared technology and, and design and product. Still, the okay. bulk of CZ USA's product is made in the Czech Republic and imported and sold through CZ USA here in Kansas City. Okay. Does anybody there call it CZ? No. And okay, good. Only the Canadians from do. Canada Just, say that. Yeah, and Canadians they get when a little crazy. When I was crazy. in customer service, it was the easiest way to tell if they were from America or not is how they said that. Yeah, it's like our second interview ever was a Canadian couple <laughs> that we shot with at Nationals, and they were like, "Oh, CZ," and I'm like, "Everybody who doesn't know what that means, that's just <laughs> Z everywhere else in the world." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. Whew. Yep. <laughs> so how did you, how did you come to you earlier? You said you started when, when you started shooting USPSA, you were working on cars Yep. and, and now you're working on guns. Yeah. How do uh, you go from cars to guns? <laughs> you're, you're buying stuff for them. So you're kind yeah, of working on them. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> I work on my own guns. <laughs> there you go. While I'm here. So, uh, started shooting USPSA in Tulsa, was working on cars then. Didn't like that career field, moved back home and worked for my parents' restaurant for several years. And I was I was getting to be sort of well-known in the Kansas City area, was shooting at that point, and CZ had a job opening for a customer service person, answering phones, taking orders for people, applied for that and got that, and then that's how I started. So, And then I've just advanced through my career. I... 
uh, was like a lead with a web store customer, uh, senior parts coordinator, I guess they called it. It was basically a lead for customer service and web store. And then I was parts manager, which had all the web store orders, did the fulfillment of those orders, did had all the customer service people answering the phone on that. So I were, did a were bunch. You, were you the so, chat guy? Hi, this is Matt. No. Can I no, help you with your order? Chat, we didn't have chat at that time. They okay, do have it thank now, you, because I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, oh, those people are so friendly. <laughs> no. And then I... So, uh, then I started doing some sourcing of stocks. So I started sourcing stocks from another local Kansas City company, and that just progressed and added on to just a little more. So I added another item, and then it eventually got where that load was so high that they split me off of the customer service team into purchasing. And then that just kept building. I just I bought everything for all the imported items and the small assembly department we had at that time. And our business has grown so much that they had to hire people. I worked with them and hired buyers underneath me to help manage the purchase orders and receiving and making sure everything's managed under that. Okay. Wow. So how long have you worked for CZ? Um, it'll be 12 years in March. Okay. I would say that's a lot of, you know, working your way up and zigzagging and all that. That's, that's yeah. pretty good. I forgot. Your family owns a, uh, a Texas barbecue restaurant, correct? Kansas City. Nice <laughs> wow. Yeah. The real barbecue Kansas City. This is about to start a fight. <laughs> I'm from Texas, so I had to say it. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't say it earlier. I, uh, it was, I it totally forgot nice about it. On this. It's about to get real aggressive. I will see you guys later. Um, good talk. This is where he makes people uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. That's how we went through this. He doesn't do that, Dave. Way to ruin it. Yeah, I totally forgot about that too. You said you went back and worked at your parents' restaurant. I was like, oh, that's right. I worked before they were on diners, drive-ins, and dives. So I worked at the small restaurant where it was like three or four employees, and two of them, well, three of them were my mom, dad, and brother. So it was true mom and pop. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Wow. How big are they now? Uh, they have They've a met huge... Guy Fieri. Yeah, twice. kind of a big deal, Dave. Couple times, couple times. Yeah, more than once, man. <laughs> so their the food's good, then, is what you're saying? Yeah, it's really good. Yep. Okay. What's the What's the name of it? Smoking Guns Barbecue. All right. If I'm ever in Kansas City, I'm, I'm already in. in. I don't even care yeah. if it's bad. Let I mean, it won't be. Yeah, I like the name. Over there. Okay, I like yeah. it. If you're ever here, just let me know. I'll take you. Anybody could do that too. Okay. Well, don't be giving away my food just yet. <laughs> they they have enough. You'll be okay. 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 Perfect. <laughs> now, um, I talked to uh, we had Mike Foley on. Mm -hmm. It was just me and him on that episode, but I talked to him about it. Um, I emailed Ted Murphy, and he replied back. But I've talked to I've asked him about live streaming the board meetings yep is there any talk of trying to make that a regular thing for all board meetings there has been talk about doing that i don't think that'll happen soon or with the current people on the board okay there's there's concerns about if people can be open enough if it was live streamed and offer their like they'd still offer their opinions or what they thought on stuff really if it was live streamed i personally have no issue with live streaming it i think it would be there's certain things like employee matters or discipline with members like you have to you have to do that stuff in private yeah absolutely and beyond that there's nothing that we talk about in those that we shouldn't talk to the general membership Right. And I mean, and that's a simple thing where, um, you know, like what we're doing right now, you just cut the screen and put just like a generic picture up there while you're in executive session. Yep. And then when you, you know, it's no different than like a County board meeting, you know, they live stream that they talk about it. They have people come up and talk, they discuss things and, 
if they need to go into executive session, they just, Hey, we'll be back in a minute. Yep. And you my put on Jeopardy range. music. Yeah. <laughs> my local range has an open board meeting where any of the range members can go and attend. Like you don't even have to ask. You just go there and show up and they'll let you in. If there's something that they have to have a closed session on, they, they boot you out of the building until they're done. Well, because for, for, uh, we talked about it with Ted, like if I wanted to sit in a meeting, like I'd have to get special permission. Yeah. And currently under the bylaws, that's only available to be done in an in-person meeting. There's no and mechanism. In that's place. a long way to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's no mechanism that, in place to have someone attend a virtual board meeting. Mm. And when, when is the next in-person? Is that in January? In January, February. it's the fifteenth and sixteenth of January in the Tampa Bay area. I don't yeah, know exactly I, where. I'll go to Tampa. So it's exactly not at where. Shot Show. No, not a Shot Show. Sorry, Dave. Uh, are you guys going to have anybody there at Shot Show? CZ is going to have a booth there at Shot Show. Yes. All right, I will be visiting them. I will not be there though. Well, there's no point in going in, Dave. You may as well just stay home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, could, uh, you, could you dry freeze some of that barbecue and set it there, and then just write Texas barbecue on it and just really confuse it? <laughs> you know what I mean? They have You'd be like this is not right. Before. You could do that. That'd be pretty awesome. I'm all in favor yeah. of doing the telecasting or the virtual board meetings. Have them put up. I'm actually in favor of having like quarterly member meetings or monthly member meetings that where all the directors would have reports and, and say updates from their respective departments. And then a, a financial statement out to the members every month. Cause I think the way it's currently being done, the financial statement doesn't come out until June or July of the next year. So at, at this moment, we could be, it, it's up to 18 months wow. before a, a financial statement is put out to the members. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of good and a lot of bad that could happen in those months. And I think the members should be aware of that. Yeah. Two whole babies can be born in that many months. That'd be a lot of, that'd be fast, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It could yeah, be a little quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But but possible. Hey, <laughs> not <laughs> no offense to the Irish, but Irish twins are a thing. <laughs> My niece and nephew. <laughs> so we also talked about um and it was in the minutes, uh, but Ted and I also or the three of us also talked about transcription, um, services, yeah. that type of stuff, so that the minutes can be they don't have to be a trans you know, a word for word transcription of the meeting, but just a little bit more like I was sharing with him some older minutes versus the newer ones seem to have more meat to them. Yep. Um, so they're, they're much nicer. At least you get a better flow of what's going on, what was discussed, all of that. Um, is that, are you guys going to stick with that version? Do you know, or I think in general, the board wants to be more transparent and put more information out there. I think the board minutes could be, obviously everything could get improved. And there's been a lot of, there's been a lot, a bunch of movement towards in that direction. So I think it'll just keep getting better. Like people that do it first thing right away, they're never really great at it. And it always gets better. So, right. Yeah. Okay. So you just had a different person doing them, basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Gotcha. <clears throat> All right. So, a <laughs> um, couple questions. One, um, did you buy 300 memberships to win election three? No, election for area three? <laughs> I thought that was pretty so, interesting. So, here's my take on that. I think Ted was saying the example from the latest election on how close it would be. It was right. And how few of memberships that could be bought that actually could influence an election. 
I agree. I won by over 300 memberships, so it, someone would have to buy more than that. But 300 memberships for one year would be like $11,000. And that is drastically more than I'm getting paid to be area director. Let me tell you that. And, and I don't think George Soros is at, <laughs> yeah, uh, interested whatsoever. So, But I, I understood his, his point. So, but I, I thought it was a funny question I had to ask you. I, I took it differently because I'm, I guess I've heard the other conversations, but that basically stemmed the one year membership before you can vote stems exactly back to that. If somebody wanted it enough, they could buy a thousand memberships, 2000 memberships. And if money wasn't a concern to them, certain people are like that where hundred thousand dollars isn't the same to them as it is to me or anything or anybody else. Right. And if they wanted the election bad enough, they could go do that under the current bylaws. And that's what they're trying to prevent. I don't think Ted was trying to say that I bought 300 memberships to vote for me. No, I don't either. I mean, he, he didn't mention that exact thing on ours, but you know, we talked about the year minimum mm -hmm. membership and, and all of that. So I knew it was going, it was all going back to that. And, it, and I mean, in a, in a, I guess in a serious way, the only people I would see that it would even matter is if you're trying to get rid of the organization, then you buy up all of the, you buy or, enough memberships to win all of the area directors. So then you can control the board and get rid of the organization. That's the only way you yeah, can do it. Yeah. Or if a position was enough pay that it made sense to buy a thousand memberships or something like that. If you spent 30 grand on memberships and you could get another extra thousand votes. If you're I, spending 30 grand on memberships, do you know how many guns or ammo <laughs> or I don't know anything that isn't that like you gotta be real and you know what I, i'm gonna say it. you gotta be real ate up to spend 30 grand <laughs> on a on a seat at the board of directors for the uspsa and you got to, to not get paid a bunch years. of money yeah. to have a bunch of aggravation for people that because you're never gonna make everybody happy you spend thirty thousand dollars to have a bunch of people be aggravated at you for a, however long two years three years or whatever yep you may as well just get married you spent the thirty thousand dollars anyway <laughs> <laughs> I I couldn't I come up with that many names. Very clear. Yeah, <laughs> love you, baby. <laughs> she didn't listen to this podcast. She don't care. So I, I guess Z USPSA, whoever that is, has created quite the stir. Yeah, um, it's it's definitely caused some issues. Has it? Um, have any of the meetings gotten hostile? Oh yeah. I got accused of leaking documents and being Z USPSA by area two director Layden. And that's, well, minutes, I, so, yeah, I saw the, yeah, the only thing in the meeting minutes was he asked you if you would leak them. But I mean, if you read between the lines, it's like, eh, I wonder how that question came about. Yeah. Yeah. I've so. not, I've not leaked the documents. I've not liked, I've not shared, I've not commented. I've not done anything related to that account or to anybody that shared anything from that account. I think it's toxic. I don't think it makes sense. It's actually hurting me more than it's helping me at this point for the presidential election. And that's all I can say, really. Like it, it is not doing me any favors at this point. It's, it's causing yeah. discontent within the board. Uh, I'll be honest. I don't think a lot of them trust me right now. And we'll have to get over that at some point or figure something else out. Is Do you think there's a, a way to overcome that? I, I don't know right now. I think they're pretty upset with the way all that's being done. And hopefully at some point, I just know I've, I'm comfortable with, with what I've done. And that's nothing. Like I haven't even acknowledged you except for I talked to Humble Marksman and he I gave him a comment on it. I talked about a steel target paint and I'm talking about it here. That's the only time I've ever even talked about it or acknowledged it in the public. Right. It 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 does seem to just be causing more issues than mm -hmm. fixes, that's for sure. Um it'll be interesting if we ever figure out who this person is. So 
but I, I, and that's the reason I asked if it's ever gotten hostile because I could see where, you know, they would assume that it's you and mm -hmm. then it, you know, nerves are on edge right now. Things are raw. So I could see where you kind of being the outsider as the new guy coming into the board that, Oh, you know, we're going to, you're going to feel isolated and on an Island. Yep. Oh, I do. I, I definitely feel like, yeah, outsider is a good way to say it. Like they've all been on the board for several years together. I think the they've all been together for two years at this point. Some have been on the board longer, but that core group of eight people have been together for two years, and I'm brand new to it. And and none of this started until you got on the board. So yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I got it. So what? <sighs> As someone coming in as a president, what would you, how would you like to see them direct the organization? I think we need to stabilize a, a bunch of stuff, stabilize the rule set, stabilize any changes, and work to better serve the current members we have and help those people stay in the sport longer than the average people do. So if people are happy with the sport, continue to compete, they'll stay with it. We have a horrible turnover rate right now in the sport. And the number is pretty close to 50% of the current members, the 35,000 number, have never even shot a match in the last 12 months. Wow. I don't know. I don't think we're doing enough to see why those people have not shot or if they're even involved in the sport anymore. We just don't know. We don't know what they're doing. There are some stats about if someone DQ'd at the first match, if they've ever come back, uh, that's such a low number. It doesn't, it's done. It's not even basically comparable to the 15,000 people that don't even shoot, haven't even shot in the last 12 months. Is there a significant disparity between the numbers for the last, like during the COVID era versus prior to that? Or is it the same throughout? It's been the same for the last three or four years that I've found and looked at and kind of tracked pretty casually. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure they have acts. They could, someone could go in there and pull all that info and see what it compares year to year. Mm -hmm. But everything I've seen since 2014 or 16, just casually remembering back or going to reference in uh, the in-person board meetings that that's been pretty common about 50% of the members actually have are competing or shooting matches within the last 12 months. I when I talked to Mike, when he was on, we touched on it a little bit and he said, there's a, a lot of that are still in paper in a filing cabinet or that if, from what I re conversation we had, that's what I recall. So do you know if that stuff is still being input where it can all be electronically managed and reached to, to determine like, because we talked about one of the, and the reason I say that is he said, you know, someone from 1985 who had a membership for one year has a number. If they were to join back today, they would get that same number again. Right. Yep. So I almost feel like it should all be made electronic, which would make it a lot easier to, quickly determine if they have a number or not. So, and I feel like you'd really be able to garner a lot more from statistics that way. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's still being done or complete or anything at this moment. I think information is the biggest thing. People talk about some, I can't get in my club. We don't need new members, but I can tell you in the Midwest, that's not an issue. So do we know where those pockets of, that are too full that need more clubs or the pockets Virginia. that have plenty of clubs, but not enough people in it. And we need to target what we're doing in the different areas. So add more clubs, to Kansas city area makes zero sense. Adding, Adding more, more where I live area, makes perfect sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you have to target different, different strategies for each of those and base it on where, what's needed where well that's we the big thing like people. you said it's people are willing to drive a certain distance mm -hmm. and no farther right 
Yeah, and, and there are you know there are matches around here that have a hundred slots or one hundred and twenty slots for a weekend local match, and they're filling up in an hour. So it's, I know. So over in this area, I know we're we're congested mm-hmm. uh, and need more outlets. But I also feel like if we had three more clubs, then just three more clubs would fill up in an hour because those people would, you know, the same people would still be shooting those matches as well. Unless they were on the same weekend. Yeah, there yeah. I think there would be some crossover, but at some point not everybody's gonna shoot everything. Because there's level of involvement. If someone just goes and shoots their once a month match, they're not as involved as someone that's gonna go every weekend day to any match no matter where it's at within three hours. And so you'll re- you'll reach a saturation point on that. And do you know Logan? Would... Go ahead. I'm sorry. No. Go do ahead. you know Logan? Do you know Logan Saunders? Yep. That dude drives <laughs> like <laughs> three to four hours <laughs> every weekend, uh-huh. everywhere. Sometimes two matches in a weekend. Yeah, that dude is insane about shooting matches. I've done that. That's fun. I did <laughs> two two majors in a weekend a couple times. That is that's a lot of work. That's got to be exhausting. Yep. Shot. So we drove down to Tulsa on Saturday. That's four hours away. No, so, drove down there on Thursday. Shot all day Friday. Nope, sorry. Messed that up. Drove down Friday to Tulsa, four hours south. Shot on Saturday. Got in our cars after shooting. Drove all the way up to Nebraska, which is six hours away from Tulsa. Shot the Nebraska state match on Sunday and then drove back to KC two and a half hours. Good Lord. Yeah. It was a fun weekend. We did it with a group of people. So took some strain off of driving and everything like that, but it was a, it was in the summer too. So it was like a hundred degrees at one match and a hundred and something at the other. Good Lord. That's that's too hot. That's going to call for a lot of hoist. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Goodness gracious. Uh, what? Speaking of hoist, what are, what are your thoughts on more sponsors of USPSA, whether it's cash or uh, product or that type of thing? Welcome at all. I think we need to, we need to give them the value that they're going to bring in. I think that's going to be the biggest challenge if you talk about some non-firearm related company coming in uh, that we have to give back the value of the sponsorship to them. I think that'll be the biggest challenge and the biggest thing that we would need to overcome as a sport to do that. Do you think that would grow the sport in a way? I think it, it would grow it. So Let's just put out this out there. If if we had a sponsor that brought in and said, I'm going to give you $100,000, just straight cash, and we, we require you to pay that back to the competitors as an awards at whatever match that they choose. I think that will change the way people compete and the effort they put into the sport. And I think that'll bring in some people that are not just doing it for the love of the sport, which I'm not saying it's a bad or good thing. It's just going to bring in different people. It's so like a comes, true professional. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. That can make a, a living off of it. A living. Yes. They'll come in and do it and we'll see different people in the sport. We'll probably see the sport change a little, just like we saw it change a little with PCC. It wasn't, it is what it is. We see it change all the time. Not saying it's good or bad or anything. I think it will change though. Because I I remember listening, I listened to the uh, Brian Conley's podcast when he had, um, oh shoot, still challenge um, champion. um, BJ? Yeah, BJ Norris. And he was talking about how in years past, there was a lot of cash to be made shooting Mm -hmm. and, and now there's none. So I'm not sure where the, you know, it's all gone from cash to product. Yeah. I think that kind of, 
from my perspective at CZ, I think that goes to what the industry companies are okay with giving away. I can give away whatever number of guns to a match, but if I requested to give that same cash value and had the company write a check for that, that would never get approved. And I think that's the biggest thing that's happening now. Now, if this sport, if that match and the sponsorship was on TV and 200,000 people watched it, that would be a different conversation that we could have with our company and different conversation we would have with USPSA by a lot. Well, but again, that goes back to what you were saying earlier, which is what is USPSA bringing to the table to offer that sponsor that they're going to get a return on their investment. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, don't, and I don't know what that is. I think it'd be hard yeah. to broadcast USPSA in the current state. The fact that you have time and points and the current state of the world is people are not willing to wait for the scores to be put up. They want to see something right away. And it just doesn't, it, it would be, you would have to figure out a program that could do it really, really fast. And you wouldn't need to go down and score the targets and wait the several minutes after someone was done shooting to get the score. Now, like in bowling okay. or any sport that's televised right now, you know the score instantly. USPSA, you do not. Okay, but all right. Now, when we were talking to Ted, mm -hmm. you know, we were talking about how all timers are basically going to Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. So we use a tablet. Cameo, like I said, uh, what Jim told me, that thing is completely wired every bay, every range, everything. So I could see where if you have a, bl a Bluetooth timer, Yep. And you, the tablet you hit, you know, download, whatever the button is, it comes in, the competitor signs or approves, then why couldn't it immediately update scores? And in the corner of your screen, then you could see, you know, the updated rankings and where that person, you know, you could have like the top 10, but then the shooter you just saw, he's 75th in B class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you I could do that. There's still there's still a delay, and after the shooting is done, you have to go score the targets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, I mean, there, there is a delay there. It, it wouldn't be 100% instant, but... And USPSA was doing that this last year. As soon as someone hit approve, they would bring that shooter's score up on some of the live streams at the back-to-back -back nationals back in October. So they're working on that. It's just there's a delay. There's still a delay, unless you got targets that how you shot and hit the target would automatically score and sync back into the tablet that then it would be hundred percent instant. Gotcha. There's stuff that they do with rifle shooting that tells exactly where they hit. Now is that cost effective across 16 targets per and 18 stages? Probably not right now. No. Yeah. At least with being a rifle shooter guy, mm -hmm. um, you know, you typically it's a stationary target. So that one camera can do it all. Or, you know, your, your sensors mm -hmm. triangulate that shot. Whereas on a USPSA field course, I mean, how many cameras at different angles are you going to have to have? To yeah, be that one per target score? minimum. Basically. Yeah. yeah. So. And anybody could accidentally shoot a target or yep. a shoot 100%. a camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I accidentally shot a cable. Yeah. 100%. I, I, the actual cable cable, not... Yeah, yeah. The cable that activated the popper. Blew it up. Perfect. So you he wasn't me, aiming for it, though. Yeah. Oh, not even a little bit. Yeah. yeah I was like, I don't want to shoot that thing. I'm just going to destroy the target. That's fine. But yeah. Oh, you tell my me, God. I'm not going to hit a camera this big by accident? Come on, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It'll happen. It was the um, target la at 2020 Nationals at Frostproof. You had the steel... Did you listen to um, Shannon... Yep. Our episode oh, yeah. was yeah. Glory Hole. Yes. That yeah. was that was the one he shot the cable at the Glory Hole. Oh yeah. Yeah. I that didn't really, yeah. No shoot out of the way. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah, it was um <laughs> I don't want to say it was my finest hour. I was impressed 
Yeah, I wasn't happy, right, they? <laughs> but I was impressed. I don't remember a target being near that cable though. No, because it was <laughs> it was a no. swinger, wasn't it? <laughs> no, it was the bobber. Yeah, that's it what the, it was. Yeah, the bobber in the, the glory hole. Hole. The cable. Like, yeah. there's yeah. you're not gonna get any sense of how far to, it's <laughs> really. It wasn't. Let's just yeah. say I took the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. It happens. It happens. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it happens every time he sees steel, but it's all good. <laughs> no big deal. It's just my life. Well, Matt, that's what I've got. Leo, you got anything? No, because every side question that I was going to ask, you were like, "Oh, hey, this makes sense to ask," and I'm like, "Well, okay, I'm just going to sit here and make funny comments instead." Then, <laughs> actually, the last thing I had was you mentioned stabilize things. Um, stabilize the well, you didn't you, before making any more rules, you'd like to stabilize everything. Yep. Can you define what you mean by stabilize? Well, I think the first thing is we need to get information and figure out what the members want. So we need to ask questions do we need to change anything? Do we need to leave it like leave stuff alone? Do we need to look at changing specific things that a bunch of the members don't like? Are the matches USPSA is putting on, is, are the consumers of that happy? It, can we do anything to improve it? I think we need to stabilize. The board needs some stability about changes all the time. I believe they've already taken that up and learned, uh, learned that just passing rule changes and then making them without getting member input and making them live right away. I think they learned their lesson on that. So I don't think that'll happen anymore. Like there is good progress being made, but little things like we don't know what areas need what. Like your area needs obviously more clubs. My area needs more shooters. Plain and simple. And we'll, you send us a club, we'll send you shooters. I was going to say <laughs> what should happen is you guys should incentivize, like you should pay people their moving costs. That would be, <laughs> match fees might get very expensive. Always thinking this guy. <laughs> I'm an idea man. There we go. I didn't say it was going to, like, you're not going to stay solvent doing that, but it's <laughs> still, it's an idea, okay? That's something we got to look at, too. Yeah. Financial use of the organization's money. Make sure it makes sense. Absolutely. Pokers and blow. <laughs> I haven't seen any of that yet. Maybe them. Ah. <laughs> what what's the perk of being president? Uh, I quit. I, I thought I thought every national championship uh, champion after the match, that's how they celebrated. Yeah. Well, now we know. No national champion either, so <laughs> neither are we, so okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's I'm never gonna see that even if that was the prize. What now what did you think of the um um the award ceremony at Talladega Super Speedway. I thought they were amazing. I thought it was. I it did was too. Very good, yeah. I thought it was a very good improvement over the low cap award ceremony. Okay. By a lot, by a very large margin. And they did that at Talladega. The, the actual did CMP? It at the range. Yep. Okay. At the clubhouse. Oh wow! I met yeah. that. That must have been tight. Yeah, and then it started to rain, so everybody was like trying to get under the cover. So it, it was a multiple thing that happened. Oh, okay. It was oh, it wow. was yeah, it was not good. They learned from that, they improved on it. So Yeah, I don't I good. don't know who who got that at the super speedway, but they deserve a bonus. Yeah, it was it was very good. It that I don't that think was they awesome. for the cost of it, and I don't even know what the cost of it was at this point. But it was it was good and it was a it was what it should be. It was very it looked like it was an award ceremony. Yeah. At yeah, a, it was at good. A, at a destination location or something that made sense for it. Agree. So yeah, all we have to do now good. is take Talladega Super Speedway to Cameo and we're good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, Matt, thanks for coming on. We greatly appreciate it. It was good talking with you. Yeah, thank you for having me. And we wish you good luck in the election if you decide to go that way. All right. Thank you. And hope and hope to see you sometime in the future, maybe even at your restaurant.
Yep, maybe. Please. <laughs> That's all I got. Until next time. Don't be a little bitch. Yeah. Thank you.